our series relating to astral theology. And we hope that a few points have been made with sufficient clarity uh, to suggest that the subject offers a key uh, to the interpretation of ancient lore and at the same time reminds us that the principles and values involved in the teaching are as valid today as they were thousands of years ago. Regardless of the times in which we live, the journey of the human soul remains the most important consideration in the life of the individual and should be one of the great dynamics of the life of the collective. Until the human being senses again his citizenship in space, until he realizes that his destiny is not fulfilled in the small cycle of immediate experiences with which he is familiar, he cannot hope to develop a long-range perspective capable of impelling us or inspiring us to a course of constructive conduct. The individual today has lost his kinship with a group of values which ancient man fully appreciated and accepted. He saw himself as part of a vast living organism. He sensed that all of space was populated with rational creatures, beings whose lives and thoughts might be infinitely beyond the comprehension of man. Yet these beings existed, and their thoughts and lives were valid experiences in nature. Old time scholarship sought to adjust man to the universe, whereas the modern thinker seeks to adjust the universe to man. This is not reasonable nor essentially possible because man is not the axis of the vast plan which moves around us. Man is part of that plan, but the plan has its own destiny. Man is involved in that destiny, but he cannot control it, nor is he the principal factor in the purpose of existence itself. Thus, by a proper modesty, by a gentle humility, by a recognition of the importance and dignity of the human estate, without exaggeration or distortion, we achieve something that is important. In religion and philosophy, particularly in recent centuries, man has become too important. He has become important in a self-centered way. He has become too egotistically significant. And in the emphasis upon himself, he has failed to emphasize his relationships with the larger world of which he is a part. Until he has proper perspective, he cannot cooperate adequately with any purpose greater than his own personal interest. Now today even we recognize larger purposes. We recognize such desirable ends as world peace. We hope to see ultimately the end of poverty. We would like to see universal enlightenment. We would like to have a factual statement of human equality. We look for the time when prejudice and intolerance will cease, and that the individual will live in a better kind of world. He cannot attain these ends, however, unless he becomes conscious of the machinery of progress, and unless he becomes willing to adjust his own personal desires with those larger motions by means of which collective goods of one kind or another can be recognized.
realized, attained. The ancient man, therefore, looking around and seeing the universe, saw it as a vast house. He saw it as a house in which there were many rooms, many departments. He also recognized life unfolding in this great structure as being composed of innumerable parts, no part actually more important than another. Some parts more advanced in their present growth, some more humble, some lives rudimentary, others apparently approaching the completion of their spans of growth. But these various differences were quantitative rather than qualitative. An ancient man recognized a common life which he had to respect, which he sought to understand, and which he did not wish to violate. We say, for example, that ancient man, when he hunted for food, he killed animals. But he killed them to live himself. He killed them to feed the hungry. Ancient man never killed for sport. He never killed for the joy of destroying. Ancient man also never built merely in order that he might create with his hands. He built with a dedicated purpose. The things that he did, he sought to make important through the help of his gods, through the dedication to his religion, to his faith. His every art and science was dedicated. His own life was dedicated. We may wonder then how it happens that so dedicated a people did not attain the end which they desired. That is, that they were not able, through dedication alone, to achieve the securities that we still seek. One of the reasons, perhaps, why they were unable to succeed totally was that, like all of us, they were in processes of growth. Even today, there is no such a thing as total achievement. An achievement is as of now. But the individual who attains the fullness of today will be deficient in the things of tomorrow. Progress goes on. The individual cannot, from the imperfect level of his own realizations, achieve to ultimates. He must grow and build and restore and repair. He must go on struggling towards the greater goal, which can only come through the greater unfoldment of himself. So our forebears long ago on the plains of Babylonia or Syria, or in some ancient mountain fastness of northern Asia, looking out upon the universe, experienced first of all kinship. The universe was not strange, it was near, it was not terrible, it was tremendous but not fear-inspiring. It was vast, but this very vastness challenged man to grow rather than to surround him with fear. And so enlightened peoples began to reach out in friendliness to the stars. They did not populate the firmament with evil beings, but with great good powers. <clears throat> and they sensed these good powers as forever protective and paternal. They sensed these powers as contributing continuously to the well-being of every creature that existed. And by the time Egyptian civilization had arisen, we see this universe in which we live strangely charted, mysteriously organized into planes <coughs> and levels and spheres and departments. There were worlds within worlds, wheels within wheels, as in the story of Ezekiel's vision. Man saw the universe as a vast structure of evolving life and saw himself moving through this structure. One of the most difficult problems he had to face in his ancient seeking was the fulfillment of his yearning uh, to share with life, to share with the total experience of existence. This perhaps was the beginning of mysticism. Certainly it was the beginning of man's seeking, where man went forth alone into the night 
to fast and to pray and to meditate. To ask the presence or ask awareness of the powers which he felt were around him and within him. Primitive man did not believe that all his deities were far above the sky. They lived in the earth and in the rocks around him. They lived in the mountains and the valleys and the trees and the waterfalls. He had this wonderful sense of the nearness of the creative agencies. We've lost this because man finds nearness only to his own kind or to the strange complicated world which he himself has fashioned. As a result of this lack of nearness to large things, this lack of ability to go out and simply contemplate and feel, man has become a highly neurotic creature. Some psychologists like to tell us that ancient man was also neurotic. He probably was to a degree. But had he been as neurotic as we are, it is questionable if the race could have survived. Actually, he had as a medicine for his neurosis so many beautiful things that we no longer have. Perhaps they were superstitions. Perhaps we feel that we have outgrown them like the fairy tales of childhood. But whatever it is, we have lost the beautiful. We've lost the sublimity of life and have locked ourselves in a world of routine patterns, of mediocrities, which neither satisfy the imagination nor nourish the idealism in our constitutions. How we shall understand this pattern in terms of astral theology uh, will require a little, a little understanding of ancient man's opinions and beliefs. Where did man come from? Well, theologies tell us and philosophies imply that man came out of a universal state. Like the old poem, he came from the everywhere into the here. The ancient man believed that in a remote period, men lived with the gods. That men were fashioned first in a strange heavenly state. That man had in his constitution something of the divine nature that he dwelt above the world in a mysterious abode of blessedness. And then he started forth on his journey. And the story of his journey is very much the story of the prodigal son. Man's beginnings in the great cycle of existence have been variously explained. The Egyptians and the Greeks were of the opinion that man primarily sought experience consciously and willingly. These peoples did not have a fall in their theology as some other nations had. This concept of man being driven out of paradise. Many ancient peoples and most eastern peoples did not feel that this was true. Man was not an involuntary exile, nor was he punished for original sin. Man went forth as an adventurer he went forth to conquer the unknown because such is the nature of man, such is the nature of life. The American Indian will tell you that just as the young man reaching maturity feels his own individuality, wants to go forth on the adventure of life, to create a new home, to bring a new world into being, so primordial man, primitive man, in the presence of the gods, is said to have looked forth into the great expanse and mystery of creation and decided to go adventuring. He wanted to know what was beyond and below and around him. He wanted the victory that comes from effort, from victory over limitation. Here again we have the story of the prodigal son because there was one son who stayed home and the son or sons who remained at home took care of their father's house, were good and obedient children, and yet one went forth as a prodigal and wasted his substance in riotous living. He went down into Egypt and he passed through great <coughs> catastrophe and great sorrow, and finally he returned to his father's house, in this case as a penitent, as a repentant one. And the father was so happy with the return of his son 
that he caused the fatted calf to be slain to form a banquet. And when the other sons said, Why should the one who has sinned be given all this attention, and we who have been good have had no attention? The father, in rapturous emotion, exclaimed, But this son was lost, and he is found again. He has been taken from us, and he has returned to us, and greater is the rejoicing because he has come back. The ancients built on that theme somewhat with other modifications. They held that there was something more important than being happy forever. And this more important thing was to go forth and learn. And behind man's great cycle of progress and growth was not the arbitrary uh, bolt of lightning or the flaming sword, but man's instinctive and nat native desire to go forth and learn. We are all learners. We are all seekers. Life is a questing after value. Life is a release into manifestation of potential strength and power. Life is man gradually gaining victory over ignorance and death and darkness. Life is a kind of game, a sublime divine game. And in this spirit, ancient man faced it. He faced it as he faced the day, fully recognizing its hazards and its dangers, but also realizing that every hazard was a potential victory. Every danger was an opportunity to be greater than circumstance. These thoughts then, according to ancient doctrine, sent man into the great mystery of the world, sent him forth out of the state of innocence into the search for virtue, out of ignorance into the questing of wisdom, and out of a static potential into a sphere of dynamic potency which he had to conquer. So man is out conquering. He has gone forth upon the mystery of self-knowing, of understanding, of gaining all the strength in himself. Therefore, according to the scripture, he will in the fullness of time be greater than the angels. Because the angels did not go forth in this great search or self-knowing and self-becoming. But in the old ways, these various steps that were taken were not regarded as we regard them, as stupendous episodes, as great problems to be greatly considered, any more than the growth of the child was a great problem. It was taught that the child was going to grow up and be a child no more. That sometime maturity would take the place of childishness, and all growth and education and preparation were toward maturity, toward self-integration, towards complete personal acceptance of the burden of individual existence. These things were behind the Greek legends and the Hindu and Chinese legends. And so man stepped out of the mystery of the heavens into the strange circles of the spheres. He began to experiment with the problem of life existence in itself. And the first thing he had to do before he could function in any sphere or any world, he had to fashion for himself some kind of a body in that world. He could not move from one state of matter to another or from one state of energy to another unless he had an instrument within himself by which he could be attuned and adjusted with the new state into which he was passing. The old philosophers' philosophies tell us that when man moved downward out of his original state, he did not cast off his divinity. He simply enclosed it in a lesser condition. He put on new vestments, but the same spiritual being was within them. As man lost his contact with the heaven world, it was not because the God in him died, or that the God in him departed, but rather that it was vestured with a heavier raiment. And this raiment was derived, as the Hermetic axioms tell us, uh, by descending through the various parts of the world. Thus in the Pymander of Hermes, we see the soul coming down through the orbits of the seven planets or the five planets and the luminaries. 
And as the soul entered into the state of each of these planetary cycles, the god or the keeper of the planet bestowed something upon the soul. And Saturn bestowed upon the soul prudence and gravity. But it also supplied a kind of veil or vestment which locked the consciousness, the pure spiritual life, within a garment of prudence, within a structure of abstract mind. And this structure was embryonic, it was unborn, it was untried and untested. It wrapped the individual in a potential. And as man descended into the great ring of Saturn, according to the ancients, he received the potential of abstract mind, the power to become prudent. He did not become prudent, he merely gained the power to be. And as he descended beyond this into the sphere of, of Jupiter, another vestment was added over as a garment upon an undergarment. A man gained the potential power of being reasonable, the power to rationalize, the power to think things through, to philosophize, to idealize facts, and to gain the actual attribute of judgment. Then he went still further down and he received another vestment over the ones that he had already gained. And this third vestment was bestowed by the spirit of Mars. And this was the vestment of courage. The individual gained the power to become brave, uh, to have patience, perseverance, to stand under the struggle and stress of things, to bear pain, to bear reverse with fortitude, to have the courage to dare added to the wisdom to be silent, which he had previously received. Then he went still further and another luminous vestment was imposed upon him, and he was surrounded with a halo of light. And in this next, or in the great solar arc, he gained for himself the power of vitality, the power of energy, courage and to be sustained and supported by energy. Without energy, man's courage remains locked hopelessly within himself. Energy becomes necessary to courage, but he gained this mysterious thing that is said in the Bible, the breath of life was breathed into him and he became a living thing, a living being. And his life came from the sun, and his life made him a dynamic creature rather than merely the patient bearer of ancient mysteries. And from the sun he passed on downward still further, and he received from the guardian of the gate of Venus. He gained the mysterious power of beauty. He gained the ability to love, the ability uh, to sacrifice with great tenderness of affection, the strange and wonderful ability to forget self, in the service of the beloved. And this vestment of love was placed upon him, not as a mature instinct, but merely as a garment. And then he went still further downward into the mystery of things, and he came to the orbit of Mercury. And here was given to him skill and cunning, and the ability to use his hands, and to fashion and to fabricate things. And he was also given quickness, and according to the Greeks, wit was bestowed, so that he might bear the rest with patience. Without a certain wit, without a certain humor in his own consciousness, without a lightness from somewhere, all these problems and burdens might be too heavy from him, for him. And then he came down into the orbit of the moon, and here imagination was bestowed. And imagination was the power it was some time to break all the bounds and boundaries that held him and to give him freedom and release into a larger life. And thus well covered with seven raiments, one within another, until he was burdened and loaded and heavy with garments and was now obscured so that he could no longer function easily or even be aware of his ancient birthright of freedom and airiness and liberty. He was then, according to the Greeks, 
cause to fall downward into darkness, into the mystery of the sphere of generation, which is the earth. And here then he was born, born with the seven vestments within himself, hidden from all sight, contained within and behind this thing which we call the body. And having entered into the sphere of generation, he became mindful of the gifts that had been given to him. He felt them moving through himself. He did not understand them, but each of these vestments was a power of his soul, a power of consciousness within him, an attribute, an aspect, an adornment, given to the soul by the stars in order that the soul might find its way back home again. And so in birth, man, heavy with the gifts of the gods, which had become a darkness upon him, a burden rather than a release, was carried by the very weight of these divine gifts into the sleep of spiritual death, which we call physical awaking. And then begins the great problem of growth. Each child, growing from infancy to maturity, passes gradually through unfoldments, and these unfoldments are the releasings of the potentials of the soul. One by one, the locked attributes, the vestments given by the gods and planets, begin to become active through the manifestation of the individual. And little by little, he comes into possession of the seven powers of the planets in his daily life. He does not know exactly what these powers are, and most of all, he does not realize that in a strange way, these powers are all restrictions upon himself, because his pure consciousness has been continuously restricted, and what we call the gifts of the planets are actually limitations imposed upon us by these conditioned psychic pressures and factors. Thus man, adorned with all these benefits, is really the victim of his own adornment. <laughs> he is less than he was in the beginning because he is no longer free to express his natural consciousness. So he goes from the cradle to the grave, and in the course of life he learns to use these various attributes which he possesses on the physical level of life. He gains skill in judgment in some cases, or he becomes prudent, or his courage is sufficient, or his skill is great, or his imagination is strong. His affections may be ardent, and his vitality may blaze forth in the number and multitude of his achievements. But all of these things represent only physical expressions of these attributes. The mysterious vestments, the gifts of the gods, are still locked within him. Now the ancients said that just as surely as man in the course of life unfolds certain potentials and uses them for the development of his orientation here, just as surely as he can only attain here by bringing into manifestation things locked within himself, so man gradually becomes crystallized by what we call old age. Little by little these potentials and powers which he has close in upon him again. His prudence becomes over caution and finally fearfulness. His judgment becomes locked by crystallization into intolerance, into opinion, or perhaps is not well enough developed to give him the power to judge righteous judgment. His courage leads him to disaster. He becomes not brave but audacious, and in such allows his ambitions to pervert his principles. His energy he wastes as the prodigal son did in riotous living. We waste our energies and sometimes wish we had them. Love leads him to innumerable tangles, uh, disconcerting circumstances. He feels that his love is wasted, or that it is betrayed, or he does not develop it strongly enough to have a constructive and creative impulse there the love of beauty and truth are ignored. The individual falls merely into the lower victimizings of the sensory perceptions. Wit, skill, produce not only the cynic and the skeptic, but skill without understanding gives us a scientific world it's not safe to live in. 
Imagination leads us into every fantasy and excess, into suspicion, into tyranny, despotism, into all kinds of terror in the night. So one by one, these powers of the soul, which should be blessed, which should give us the full measure of realization, betray us and leave us victim uh, to the excesses which their perversions indicate. Such was the state of man uh, when the ancients conceived the idea of creating the great ladder of the mysteries. This great method of release, not release for this life alone, not release merely for years or for days, but the recognition that what we call evolution is man's victory over all the limitations imposed by conditions upon the unconditioned consciousness within himself. So a great symbolical pattern was created which reversed the, evo the involutionary procedure. Man gratefully and gladly returned to each of the guardians of the spheres the gifts which they had bestowed. He outgrew these gifts. He rose above them. He transmuted and transformed them and handed back the vestments and the adornments which they represented. There are ancient fables in the East about this. The fables of the king who so adorned himself with his jewels and with his wealth and with all the symbols of his honors and dignities that when he fell into a river he drowned because of the weight of his adornments. And this is what happens to man. Because of the weight of his adornments, he falls into generation and drowns in matter, becoming what we call a materialist or an unenlightened person. But the rescuing of this was by the long process of outgrowing conditioned existence. And to achieve this end, the soul had to consciously ascend through the seven orbits of the stars. Ascending as a star, the goddess ascended from the dark threshold of the moon god up through the seven gates to the upper world from which he had come. The journey back upward, like the mysterious story of Dante being led by Beatrice from the Purgatorio into the Paradiso, is always man's eternal psychic entity leading him back by his dreams, his aspirations, and his affections to the great spheres from which he fell, or from which he descended not by uh, a moral fall, but by a determination or decision to seek adventure, to seek things, and in gaining things, to lose self. This is also the burden of Buddhism, that man gaining all other things has as a result lost pure consciousness, without which his journey to light cannot be perfected. In astral, astral theology, then, the soul first sought to escape from generation, sought to escape from the mystery of death, or perhaps to escape by death from the mystery of this world, to come back to a state in which there was no longer any worldliness in him, to draw him back again into material existence. To escape from the world, he must therefore escape from worldliness. And what were the uh, what were the great pressures of worldliness, which had to either be overcome or man would be drawn back? In fact, he could never escape. Death was only an exchange from the visible to the invisible side of nature. Man never actually transcended the great material sphere of things, either in life or in death. He merely disappeared and appeared again by the ancient concept of rebirth. He was never away from worldliness until worldliness ceased within himself. Religion held this to be true, and most of your mystical theologies were derived from the ancient astrotheological symbolism of the soul beginning its journey upward by its effort to overcome the world. This is another meaning, of course, of the dragon slave the individual overcoming monsters, the knight-errant going forth and rescuing the fair maiden 
by killing the wicked ogre or the giant or the monster which had this maiden captured in his castle. The maiden, of course, is the psychic self, which must be rescued by the determination of the individual to overcome the giant of mortality or of materiality. And there is no way in which we can conquer the world. Perhaps there is a perverse psychology behind all this great belief that man could escape the world by conquering it. Perhaps the reason why we have had Genghis Khan's and Hitler's and Alexander's and Caesar's, Mussolini's and Stalin's, is because the human soul has misread an archetypal symbolism. Man has sensed that he had to overcome the world. But because perhaps his own enlightenment was not great enough, he thought he could free himself from it by becoming master over it. He thought he could finally reach that condition in which he was free because he was a law unto himself. When he reached that security, when he bound the whole world in slavery to his purpose, then no one could contradict him, no one could deny him, no one could refuse him, no one could thwart him. Then he thought, I am free. But he never found that to be true. He found with Wolf at the time of the Battle of Quebec. He found that the path of glory leads but to the grave. He discovered finally that he could not escape the world by conquering it. <coughs> that he could never reach a condition of security so complete that he was free from the world. Therefore he turned as the mystic turned to another method. Instead of attempting to conquer the world, he attempted to conquer worldliness in himself, realizing that he was bound here by these very ambitions which he sought to satisfy or to gratify. Consequently, by becoming desireless, by no longer responding to the allurements of the world, by no longer admitting the power of the world, he could perhaps escape uh, from its tremendous, insidious effect upon himself. Ancient man then really believed that he had to be born again out of this world, if possible, born without death. That instead of dying out of a material state, he must die out of the materiality in himself. This was the second birth. This was the twice-born one who had achieved conscious liberation during life. It was a birth into a new state in which the Greeks said the hero dwelt. The hero being the person who had overcome the world as an experience of consciousness was therefore free from it because it could no longer be stimulated in himself. He would no longer hate. He would no longer desire. He would no longer sacrifice his principles for his possessions. He gained a certain detachment. How did he do it? Usually by becoming internally conscious in some way of something superior to the world. He could not escape while he believed in the world. But if by mystical experience or by the strange disciplines of ancient esoteric sciences and philosophies, <coughs> He was able to experience inwardly a freedom from this world and realize that in departing from it as an experience of consciousness, he was not leaving the greater for the lesser or the known for the unknown, but rather that he was leaving something that he had outgrown, leaving darkness for light, leaving things that are not true for things that are gaining more than he could possibly lose, finding himself by sacrificing that which was not his real self. Buddhism taught this in renunciation, that the individual, through inward discipline, gradually relaxed away from the world. And having done so, he passed through the first gate of the mysteries and was, for the beginning of his journey, a free soul, a soul searching light. 
And beyond this, he then had to pass through what the ancient Indians might have called the yokas. He had to pass through the levels of the planets. And he had to return to each one of these planets the garment or gift which each had bestowed to him. And the only way he could return any of these garments was to outgrow them. He could not cast them off. He had to achieve a victory over them. He had to make himself greater than they were. He had to exhaust their usefulness and their ability to hurt him. He could only, therefore, go on when he had achieved complete mastery over the mystery that was represented for the planetary gift. So when he came to the orbit of the moon on his return journey, he had to transform the potential of imagination into the full release from it, the full expression of it. He had used imagination first unwisely, then wisely. And finally he had reached a point where imagination was no longer important. Where the individual exchanged his imaginings for the facts which he had discovered for the growth of his own consciousness. Man does not have to imagine the wonders of the world if he understands the world. The world is in fact more wonderful than any dream that he could have. And through true and complete understanding, the distortions, the imageries, and the fantasies of things were no longer vital to him, no longer necessary to give him inspiration or impulse. Let us say, for example, that a person is inspired to do a good deed. He may be inspired by hope, or by faith, or by charity. He may imagine all the wonderful outcome that will follow this good deed. And therefore, he is strengthened to do it. But when he is wiser, he will do that good deed without any of these overtones at all, simply because a certain action is lawful, right, proper, necessary, and the only thing conceivable. When he reaches this point, he can return the cloak of imagination to the lunar guardian who keeps it. He no longer needs it. He is not deficient in anything that imagination stands for, but he has released consciousness from imagination and into fact. And the fact is more beautiful, more wonderful, and more true than anything that he could imagine. Then he goes on what to the problem of skill and to this little humor problem that we described. He must return to Mercury the gifts which this orbit has given to him. And so we find that he returns uh, to this level, that level of his mentality, which has to do with proficiencies of all kinds. He returns the powers which Mercury has, among them the arts and sciences, because these arts and sciences were all schoolrooms in which he studied. And having mastered the lesson, he no longer needs them. Having transcended sensory perceptions, he is no longer dependent upon them. He moves inward into the archetypal soul powers by means of which he can direct his higher destiny. So he returns to Mercury, these problems. And he also returns this element of humor. For this humor is no longer necessary to the individual who values things correctly. Because the moment he values them correctly, they are sufficiently satisfying and sufficiently optimistic so that the truth is more joyous uh, than any interpretation or any jest that we can create about it. And he returns in due force and time uh, the emotion of love and beauty to the keeper of the orbit of Venus because he has now discovered a transformation of emotion within himself. He is no longer the subject to profane affection. He has rather transformed all personal emotion into compassion or the great spiritual attribute of love. He has gained a soul power and it is no longer necessary for him to use the instruments of trial and error which he previously knew. He then ascends to the sphere of the sun and here he returns his energy because he no longer needs to do as Satan does, rush up and down the world. He no longer needs activity as we know it, because the greater activity is a psychical 
quality within himself beyond dimension. Vitality is no longer necessary. In its place is a simple directive. He is no longer burdened with body building or the need of energies and vitamins to maintain himself. All these things are necessary because of his own ignorance, and as he becomes wiser, he outgrows them. He then returns also his courage to the orbit of Mars, because courage is only necessary in the presence of the unknown. When the individual recognizes the immutability of good, he needs no courage, for he knows there can be no evil thing happen to him. And he returns to the sphere of Jupiter, the judgment which it bestowed. And lastly of all, last of all, he returns to Saturn, its prudence. And then, as the uh, wonderful uh, golden verse of Pythagoras says, the soul freed from all these bonds and all these burdens and all these raiments rises in its own pure nakedness to return again to the world of light from which it came. It has, however, passed through a strange uh, experience, a strange transformation. Because in the Greek philosophy, the soul that descended, descended in the childish ignorance of the unknown around it and within it. But the soul ascending has ascended by conscious, intentional victory, step by step. So the innocent, childish soul that descended gives place to the strong, mature, virtuous soul that has decided all things and has chosen to cling unto that which is good. Thus the journey of the soul through the spheres it gives man the power of decision. It gives him the, the right to choose to be right. And as a result of that, it gives him good destiny. It gives him the right to earn a destiny, which cannot be earned unless all factors composing it are voluntary decisions of his own. The gods could preserve man in innocence, but only man himself, given the opportunity to do both right and wrong, can achieve to the state of virtue, which is the determination to cling to that which is right. So this journey was a kind of initiation, and all your initiation rites and ceremonies of ancient man were based upon this story, based upon man gradually achieving victory over the seven parts of his own soul, restoring their attributes to the universe from which they came, and resurrecting by, uh, victoriously from the sevenfold body or psychic entity which contained and locked him within itself. Now in China we have another interesting simile which was also well known to the ancients. Namely, every time at the service of the fortunate new year, during the great period of the Manchurian uh, emperors, the streets of the Forbidden City, the great wonderful road of state in Peking, was strewn with the sand of Gobi to connect the imperial city, the vermilion city of the emperor, with the temple of heaven of the fortunate new year. And here in simple white robe, on the day of the ceremony, the emperor, alone and unattended, walked the yellow sand of Gobi from the imperial palace to the altar of heaven. And here before heaven, he made his offerings. Here he offered himself as the living sacrifice for the well-being of his people. And in this ceremony, it was said that he followed the will or dictates of the ancient emperor Shanti, the imperial heaven. For this emperor, who was more or less the golden emperor of the sun, walked the wonderful gold sand, the strewn band of the zodiac, and the great annual journey to the feast of the fortunate new year, was part of the astronomical mystery in ancient China. We've already mentioned the perilous journey of the sun through the signs of the zodiac. Among the Greeks and Persians particularly, this perilous journey was again revived in connection with the human soul. The soul or psychic self was therefore regarded as performing twelve labors a man in his journey through the great spiritual year of his destiny, the year composed of the length of time that took him to move from ignorance to wisdom. 
from mortality to immortality, accomplished this by means of twelve labors, and these were the labors of Hercules, and they were also the mysterious voyages of Sindad the sailor, and they are contained very beautifully concealed, but quite clearly stated, in the Odyssey of Homer. These uh, legends and fables were all derived from the mystery rituals. In the Egyptian rites, there were twelve deities, twelve ancient gods, who sat in judgment. These twelve gods passed upon the virtues and vices of the human soul. They were the testers, the triers, the guardians, and only those who could pass successfully the examinations given by the twelve gods of the old road were permitted to pass on into the blessedness. Now these twelve gods, gods or guardians of the old road, of course, relate to the solar mystery. And as man became a little more sophisticated in his astronomy and a little more aware of the mystery of the year, he likened his own spiritual cycle of life to this story of the annual journey of the sun. So man started out with the firm conviction that this mystery revealed to him the things he had to do. For the old question is asked again and again, what must a man do that he shall be saved? And this problem of being saved to the ancient meant that he must be worthy. Salvation comes from the same word as salary. That is, we are paid a salary. A salary to the Romans, as the word salary implies, was a payment in salt. Because the Roman soldier was paid in salt, a very valuable and important and useful commodity. And the payment that he received in salt was called his salary. Now salvation comes from the same thing. It means well salted. <laughs> and it also means that those who are saved are the salt of the earth. Because salt is also the most ancient thing for the preserving of food. When they didn't know what to do with it, they put it in brine. And by putting it in brine, they could keep it indefinitely. So salvation meant to be kept in salt. Now we have hardly that idea of it anymore, but it has its useful per points. Because if the, the salt shall lose its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? And uh, in the scriptures we hear a great deal about it. Now in the ancient days of royalties, particularly in England, they had a very large salt cellar. It was a symbolic one that looked more like the trophy that you win uh, when you do a particularly good round of golf or something of that nature. A uh, trophy cup. The salt, the great salt, might be two feet high. And it was placed on the baronial table. That is, it was placed on the table of the nobleman, dividing those who sat above the salt and those that sat below the salt. And great people sat above the salt, and common humble people sat below the salt. And the interesting point was that the sign of poverty was that you did not have enough salt. The salt was a luxury at one time that belonged very definitely to the great and the privileged. And those that uh, were above the salt were supposedly the salt of the earth, although from what we can learn in English history it wasn't always quite literally true. <laughs> But here we come to this point, what must a man be do to do to be saved? <clears throat> Salvation had to do with preservation. And preservation had to do with man performing certain dangerous tasks and surviving wonderfully these hazards and these tests. And in order to uh, achieve these ends, he had to show his courage. And in your Greek legends of Hercules, you see that for various reasons, uh, usually to satisfy some deity, the hero had to perform some peculiarly hazardous and dangerous undertaking, presumably beyond mortal accomplishment. Well, this problem is, is quite obvious. 
the attainment of even a reasonably enlightened standard of living is almost beyond human comprehension. <laughs> it is little short of a magnificent example of heroics of some kind. We do not see the sword striking or the helms with their brilliant plumage. We do not hear the crash of battle, but every achievement that we make is a struggle against pressures, struggle against a many-headed hydra, for as we lop off one bad habit, seven more grow from the blood. <laughs> Everything we try to do confronts us with mythological situations, just as remarkable and dramatic as those in our ancient fairy lore, for all folklore deals with archetypal symbols, symbols of man's struggle for security. So in the ancient Greek and Persian rites, in the temples, the band of the zodiac was stretched across the sky. Sometimes it was made into the mosaic floor. Very often it was traced upon the robes of priests and upon the garments worn by neophytes. Apuleius wore the star-spangled cloak when he went in to the mysteries. These stories had to do with the journey, the perilous journey of the soul through the seven, through the twelve tasks that had to be performed before a man can be saved. And these twelve were represented by the zoans or the animals of the zodiac. And these animals in turn were each of them an emblem of some ancient law or principle, a hieroglyph signifying a positive and negative attribute. Each one of these creatures was either a constructive or a destructive force. Each one had its privation and its success, and it also had its moderation. The work of the hero was to pass the test without in his own turn violating a principle. If he violated one law in order to keep another, he became hopelessly involved in a labyrinth. The great trick was not to win primarily. The great achievement was to win without having done anything that would cause a loss. In other words, you could always slay your enemy, but how to overcome him without hurting him was more difficult. You could always be angry at evil and oppose it, but how to oppose it without being evil yourself, that was more difficult. How to end sequences of causations without setting new ones in motion doing it. How to so conduct oneself that the correction of one evil did not engender ten more. So ancient man, morally and ethically, navigated his Argo, or his Argonaut, his great expedition on the ship of salvation. According to the map of the heavens, he had to keep the laws of heaven. He had to follow the stars of heaven. And he had to follow in faith. And he had to withstand the tempest of circumstances with a greatness of spirit, or he could not succeed. Much of this is beautifully concealed in the part of the fifth book of Virgil's Aeneid, where we have a further description of the initiation ritual. So we will assume that after all these thousands of years, man still must walk the strange star-spangled road of the zodiac. He does not walk it in the sky, but as he walks it through a series of qualitative experiences in himself. So we will begin now with the sign of Aries, the wrath. We've already indicated uh, the religious significance and the great institutions of the mysteries that were created around these signs, so we will not consider them at the moment. Now when we do think religiously of the ram, however, we think of the Lamb of God, we think of the scapegoat of Israel. We think of the offering of the ram of Ammon. We have many various meanings 
the seven-horned ram of Revelation stands out, and the ancient ram's horn, which blew the covenant, we also remember, and the ram's horn trumpet of Hindo, which called to the last great war in the Nordic mysteries. This ram's horn cup, in which the Eucharist of the ancient Gothic rites uh, was celebrated. All these tell us interesting things and remind us of the universality of symbolism. Actually, the great key, it seems to me, of Aries from the standpoint of the moral virtues of man is courage. Courage, which belonged to the planet Mars in the previous cycle, belongs also to Aries, which is the essential dignity of Mars. It is where Mars is peculiarly enthroned. So courage is the beginning of the journey. Without courage, nothing can be achieved. Ulysses has to start forth in courage. Hercules had to have courage. The seeker after truth must have courage. Now what is the root of courage in man? What gives man courage? Hope? imagination, dreams, convictions, or perhaps even more than these things, the great path of his people, the way of the good and the brave who have gone before. Courage is steeped in tradition. Courage comes from the authority of sacred writing. Courage comes from the inspired words of divine teachers. But man must have courage the courage to do, to dare, to go on. <laughs> so out of courage he must build and fashion his first instrument. And yet with courage he has other problems because Aries also signifies combativeness. And here combativeness must be eliminated because combativeness will lead to war, will lead to stress, will lead to ultimate perpetuation of the sowing of the dragon's teeth. So man must have courage without aggression. He must have strength without ambition. He must have dedication without despotism. He must have the ability uh, to rise above obstacle without the inevitable tendency to enslave or destroy the rights of others. So the delicate test of courage rests with him. How to be strong yet kind. How to be brave yet simple. How to be great yet humble. All these mysteries play out in the conduct of human life in which we must gradually identify this mysterious symbol of the competitive and combating animal with the Lamb of God the symbol of purity and of truth. Thus, the animal of fire, the animal of war, the ram, also becomes the symbol of the Prince of Peace. And this is our victory, which has to be achieved within our own consciousness and experience. We must have the courage without the combativeness. We must have the dedication without the ruthlessness to carry it over the bodies of the dead. And so man must achieve without destroying. He must obtain without injury. He must solve the mystery without bringing disaster upon any other living thing. Thus becomes the test, the mysterious problem which he has to solve. And when he has solved it, assuming that he does, or at least that he has solved it as far as he can at any given moment. Then he passes on to the second sign of Taurus the bull. And under the symbol of Taurus, he has that peculiar power of steadfastness. Now steadfastness is the indomitable determination of purpose. But how can we have this steadfastness? without other less favorable aspects appearing in connection with it. How can we be steadfast and not stubborn? 
that, Mr. Trick. The ancients developed a great philosophy on the individual who could remain true to himself without being untrue to somebody else. The individual who was capable of being serenely purposeful and at the same time not be locked, not be closed, not be held by some false attitude in his own mind. Very much of the loyalty that we think about is only stubbornness. Dedication is not what it always seems to be. It is just habit. It is the individual doing it because he has always done it and not because it is right. So under the sign of the bull comes this mysterious power, this tremendous power of this creature the power to go on, to persevere. For like the plodding ox that draws the plow through the ancient muddy waters of the Nile bank, like the same stolid ox that is on the rich man's table, like the ancient Nandi, the bull that rides Shiva upon its back, the bull of heaven and the bull of earth, and the bull which Virgil says opens the egg of the year with its horns. This bull of continued determination must be analyzed morally, spiritually, into motive and into every conceivable understanding that we can bestow upon it. We must fight and solve the mystery of the Minotaur within its labyrinth. <coughs> For this was the bull-headed man. Sometimes we say that people are bull-headed. And we are not referring to the Minotaur in most cases when we say that. <coughs> we are referring to an objectionable stubbornness. And yet in the midst of this symbol of the labyrinth, in the ancient Greek legend, the labyrinth of Crete, the labyrinth of the ancient temple, palace, here we have the world with all its strange and torturous passageways and chambers ruled over by the bull-headed symbol of stubbornness, arrogance. Look around you. Everybody knows he's right and everything goes wrong. We can get an ear for very little. Everyone is determined to protect his own interests. Everyone has closed his mind to that which differs from it. And he, smugly entrenched behind his own defenses, is concerned primarily with the security of himself and his group. And with old prejudices and unchangeable crystallized attitudes, we seek desperately to prevent the growth of tomorrow or the survival of today. This is the Minotaur ruling the world. It is reaction. It is the old stubborn pride. It is the individual who must fight with his own fear of change, with his own determination to be loyal to his opinions rather than to truth. And the hero must fight that fight. And it's a great fight, and everyone doesn't win immediately. Now the third side that the soul is confronted with is Geminus, the twins. And here we come into a very intriguing problem. The problem of psychological polarity. Here we come into one of the strange things that is most obvious in the human mind. The more stupid a person is, the more certain he is. <laughs> the more thoughtful he becomes, the more uncertain he becomes. And you take the comparatively thoughtful individual and you say, I want a yes or no answer. You'll have a very hard time getting it. <laughs> you will get the famous political answer. Yes. Then again, no. 
The individuals say it would seem this way, but perhaps it is the other way. Why? Because we pass through a period in which, as someone said, we become broad-minded but a little flat-headed at the same time. <laughs> we mistake uncertainty for generosity. We like to think we're liberal, but the fact is we do not have the answer. And because thoughtfulness gives caution, we have lost directive in a great many instances. So everything in life is polarized. And we have the uh, various Aristotelian techniques of either and or. We have the individual who, departing from the evil, would cling to the good, but has already established a polarity that has destroyed truth. We have persons seeking the soul against the not soul, only to discover tomorrow that they were wrong on both counts. We have the individual who tries to judge fairly, but fails because he does not know the facts involved on either side. We also find the individual who tries to help but fails to help because he does not really know what is helpful. And wherever he would be helpful, he is capable of harm. The polarities go back and forth. So this side of Gemini represents <coughs> mental division within the individual. Mental division leads to disillusionment, skepticism, cynicism. Mental division also leads to weakness and it leads to the elevation of the functions of the mind above the purposes of the mind. The, we develop the thinker for the sake of thinking and not for the sake of the thought. We develop the individual who writes beautiful words but never means anything. We, write the, we hear or see the grammarian who can construct a sentence perfectly but the sentence never contains anything that will change the course of history. It is skillful, but not purposeful. So this division, by separating and destroying the penetrating power of intensity, leaves the individual upon the twin horns of the Gemini dilemma. He is unable to determine anything, or he is locked in the polarized conflict of things. One of the good examples of that is the American Civil War where we have the War of the Brothers. In ancient England, Lily said that the United States was under the sign of Gemini, the twins. And we had the War of the Brothers. It is now nearly a century since that war, and yet we're still fighting it. And we're still struggling over it. And we're still trying to figure who was right and who was wrong. And we have a great many people who do not care who was right or who was wrong. They're on the other side, whichever it may be. <laughs> We cannot let it die. So Gemini gives us another thing. It gives us this division, it intensifies prejudice, and then it never lets anything die. It keeps on fighting the war after everybody's dead. It keeps on uh, winning the argument after everyone else has gone home. And it keeps on trying to figure out how it could have won the argument for days after it has lost the argument. <laughs> Division. All this seems uh, perhaps a little on the flighty side, but underneath it, there's a principle here. This principle of duality, which caused Pythagoras to spit upon the ground whenever the number two was mentioned, simply because it represented division. Wherever there is division, there is loss. That which the gods would destroy, they first divide. And wherever there is division, then there is need for reconciliation. And this process of reconciliation is itself a strangely subtle form of hypocrisy. Nothing seems to work out. Because actually, we are de dealing with things substantially indivisible. Their unity must be acknowledged, not achieved by human defense. It is there to begin with. And we cannot defend it, we must discover it. 
There was a very peculiar problem which we have to go on to very carefully. Then we pass to the next type where we gain the mysterious heritage of the moon. And the moon gives us the strange inheritance of moods. The moon gives us light and darkness. It gives us this strange inconstancy within ourselves. It caused Paul to cry out in his agony, when I would do good, evil is ever nigh unto me. It causes the individual this strange weakness in his own nature, making him a servant of tides, making him moved upon surfaces which he cannot control like a ship in a storm. And this strange moodiness of man the mood of greatness and the mood of failure, the inability of the individual to depend upon himself, the inability of the individual to rise above the pressures of his own passing moods. So the hero must master his own moods. He must master the inconstancies by which one day he is for and another day he is against. He must pass beyond those moods which weaken him in time of need. Moods which mean that his total resource is not available to him at any time. So the moon tells us that everything ebbs and flows, that everything seems to have beginning and end, and that everything is upon the sea of life, subject to generation, and degeneration, life and death, birth and decay, these things moving in strange cycles, and in man these cycles infinitely repeating themselves, so that with every phase of the moon man hopes or fears by pressures which he cannot understand. Thus man, fighting the moon, fighting this struggle within himself, is fighting the inconstancy of himself, uh, fighting the insecurity in which he cannot depend upon his own nature to stand behind him. He must bring his own nature into line. He must conquer the shifting rays of the moon's phases. He must gain the ability to keep his light even when the moon becomes dark. So the moon has always been the symbol of the lesser light. It has been the symbol of man's hope, dream, faith, one moment strong and another weak, increasing, waxing, waning. And here man seeking constancy, seeking mastery over the excess of his moods, so that he shall do no thing too much nor too little watching himself against the pressure which forces his idealism into vanity, forces his dedication into fanaticism, forces his determination to serve into hypocrisy simply by pressure. Because pressure can cause an individual to say the end justifies the means. The moment he has done so, the madness of the moon is upon him. Now after this, situation, he meets the next struggle in which he must overcome the lion and perhaps clothe himself in its skin. Yet in the ancient legends he must slay the lion without a weapon. He must slay it with his bare hands and he does so by breaking its jaw. This is the story of Hercules and also the story of Samson. Now the lion is the home of the sun, it is the sign of energy. And to overcome or conquer the lion and clothe oneself in its skin is to overcome pride, overcome power, overcome force in its every aspect. For there is scarcely a moment in our days when we are not uh, tempted to do something a little more strenuously than the ethics will permit. We have the feeling that with a little more force, 
we can accomplish our end. We can overwhelm our adversary. We can sell that merchandise which he does not want. We can force. We can use energy, not for our own advantage, but for the disadvantage of someone else. And the moment energy transcends its natural usefulness, it becomes like gunpowder. Gunpowder may help to blast a dead stump out of a farmer's field, but it has also laid the world waste with war. Atomic energy may give us new sources of light and power and warmth, motion, but it can also wreck us. So that power within the individual, if harnessed to conscience, if bound to consciousness, as in the ancient fable of the, of the young maiden binding the lion's jaws with her handkerchief, an ancient figure found sometimes on tarot cards, if gentleness can hold the power of the lion and the unicorn, we then understand something that is very important to us, namely that nothing that is good shall ever be attained by force. The moment you use force, the force becomes evil. Yet it is life without force, energy without pressure, action without aggression. These are the secrets that the ancients tried to tell us must be conquered and mastered and understood by the soul as it walks along the yellow road offering itself as a gift to heaven. And we go on to the sign of the Virgin. And here we come to one of the most ancient symbols in the old zodiac system. And we find it curiously associated with one great keyword out of antiquity. The conquest of the mystery of the Virgin, the capture of the girdle of the Amazon, has to do with the mystery of service. So the crest the Prince of Wales in England is taken from the ancient Germany in Iser. These were the last words of Kundry as she fell dead at the foot of the grail. I serve. Service becomes one of the great problems of the labor. And to achieve service, one must understand the mystery of the world virgin. For service is actually bringing forth into life. That is the meaning of service. When we serve, we bring something forth into life. When we serve the need of our friend, we help to bring that friend forth out of darkness into light. All service is releasing life. In the ancient agricultural content or context, the virgin carries the sheaf of grain because if man serves the earth, it brings forth the harvest. Service, therefore, is making ready the way. It is perhaps sounded in the words of John the Baptizer. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. The service is to prepare the way of life. Service is to prepare the way for those who do live. Service for the young is preparing them for life, preparing them to bring forth. Service of the strong, if we help a man in trouble, it is in order that we can assist him to bring forth out of himself those resources which are his true solution and which we cannot convey to him. Therefore, service requires great discretion. Service requires a wisdom almost beyond this world. But the symbol of service for the Virgin is the great question, what must we do in order to do good? And to answer that question requires practically all the wisdom of the ages. Well, usually our help is of a sentimental nature. We are kind, we are sympathetic, we do something. And because we do not know what we are doing or why we are doing it, 
we then sometimes come to a keen disappointment for the person neither appreciates nor understands and our good intention is imposed upon or exploited. It is because our good intention was not wise with the wisdom of the server. We do not know how to serve. So to struggle with the problem of how to help another and at the same time not hurt him, for well, that is the rule, we must never hurt reminds us again that the only way that we can serve another person truly, perhaps, is to help him to do those things which are nearest to his own soul. Try to find out what his need is and then help him do what he wants to do rather than what we want him to do. Otherwise our service goes immediately into dogma and into despotism. But the problem of service, of sharing without hurting, of giving without impoverishing, those are the secrets of the mystery of the maiden with the sheaf of grain. And the next time we stop in the great zodiacal circle, we stand in the presence of the balance of Libra. The pair of scales tipped strangely and held by a strong angel with a blazing sword. And here man seeks the problem of equilibrium. For justice is always balance. Justice arises from fairness. Fairness arises not from a man's ability to see the two sides of a situation, because there are usually more than two sides. Justice consists in recognizing the law as it applies to all sides. Thus Pythagoras pointed out that virtue is not upon one end of the pan, one pan of the balance, and vice upon the other, and we do not weigh the living and the dead. Vice is at both ends, and balance or truth is in the center. And it is only the scale that balances that is true, and the only true part of the scale is the balance in the center. So man searching always for survival, for truth, seeks equilibrium within his own consciousness, realizing that the moment he polarizes or unbalances, he will be unlawful. So to bring all extremes to moderation gives him justice, for justice is moderation. Justice is in no thing excess or privation. Justice is in all things truth victorious over all error. Thus there may be fifty errors about a matter, but only one truth. And justice is to discover that truth. Man surrounded by many factors in living must seek always the balance, must seek always the truth that underlies all these different contending, dissenting parts. He can never know them all. He can never understand them all. He can never recognize them all. Therefore, he remains true only to the balance. Keeping the equilibrium, and in all matters, clinging to the law. For the law is his hope and his salvation. So by library he is taught that in all matters, he must, first of all, be true to principle. And if he is true to principle, all other things will balance out. And he passes from there to the ancient sign of the scorpion, sometimes represented as a serpent and again as an eagle, the only sign which has three distinct glyphs of its own. Now they said in ancient times that the scorpion was the symbol of death. But in the old mysteries, the, the sign of the scorpion and the sign of Scorpio, the night house of Mars, the nocturnal entrance to the underworld was always guarded by the god Hippocrates, not Hippocrates, Hippocrates, the god of silence. And he was always represented standing or seated at the front of the temple in this position with one finger on his lips. He was the god of silence. 
So the sign of Scorpio in the old mystery rituals taught us the secret of silence. The most valuable noise that there is. <laughs> silence is a strange, deep darkness. But silence, while it may seem to be the mother of mysteries, is exactly and actually the firstborn of truth. For in silence and silence alone, all mysteries are solved. All soundings end in silence, and from silence came all sound. A man, in his search for reality, must not only have courage, have skill, and have understanding, but he must also have the power to be silent. For if to speak is silver, as the German proverb used to say, to be silent is golden. And this golden silence is not merely not speaking. It is a silence of quietude within consciousness. It is this actual problem of being still that we may know the mystery of the divine presence. <coughs> so the sign of Scorpio has always been peculiarly associated with the mystery rituals. All rituals had to do with death. All symbolical transformations were represented by the mortuary ritual. The initiate passing into the underworld in the ritual went through the mystery of death, presumably, symbolically. For he descended, as the rite says, into the great silence. He descended into the aloneness, into the abyss of darkness. And here he must not be afraid. So silence is the gateway to internal life. And for every person who can speak wisely, there is a greater wisdom for those who can simply listen. Strangely, the power to listen is greater than the power to speak. And who listens learns. Who speaks knows only about himself. <coughs> Thus in the ancient rites, the search for silence was the ability of the person to remain eternally receptive and observant, always able to accept, and never interrupting God with his own voice. For in the mysteries, to speak is to interrupt God, but God is the infinite truth abiding in the silence. And when our speaking gets too loud, we cannot hear the voice of the infinite. So to be quiet, to be receptive, to conquer sound in our own souls, to seek silence, this is to pass this mystery of the Scorpio, who becomes transformed into the serpent of wisdom and into the eagle phoenix of inspiration. Now the ancient sign of Sagittarius was the old sign of aspiration, but it represented the old centaur, who was the teacher of Achilles. It was therefore the representative of nature. It was representative of the universe. The centaur is the universe as man's instructor. Therefore, out of the many levels and powers of the natural process come the instructions which are to serve man. And the great instructions are religion, philosophy, and science. And the centaur represents these because he is born out of the threefold mystery of the universe, part human, part animal, and aiming his shaft at the stars. So in this particular mystery, uh, in the search of the soul for reality, the centaur represents instruction. Now instruction is a strange word. What shall a man learn? How shall he learn? How shall he know when he has learned? The ability to receive instruction, said Socrates, is first of all the ability to accept reproof. The individual is hypersensitive to any criticism of his own thinking, who is unable 
to change his own attitudes, who is more important, who considers it more important to remain the same than to accept guidance, has not learned the mystery of instruction. For instruction, as Emerson points out, is the inevitable co consequence of the enlightened human being's contact with nature, whether it be human nature or universal nature. From every other human being we can learn something. For this human being may be only of our own kind, the animal body of the centaur. But yet there is not a person who lives that does not know something that we ought to know. In the same way, we can learn from every branch of knowledge, not only its immediate instruction, but its great message, the message about universals. And we can see that all knowledge flows from the great fountains of universal consciousness, and that sky and earth and air are forever teaching, that the sunrise and the sunset are our instructors and that everything that happens as a message, adversity, sorrow, problem, responsibility, these are the teachings of the centaur. For the centaur is life <laughs> and nature, teaching us to become heroes. And some will reject the teacher because the body is that of a horse. Others will say, that the teacher itself is only an imperfect creature rising out of its own darkness. But nature is that. Nature is a god with the body of a horse. And nature is the teacher. And it is teaching us both human ways and divine ways. It is teaching us both the mysteries of our animal existence and of our universal state. To be receptive and to recognize instruction and to see the universal teacher in the simplest of our friends, or perhaps in our own children, is to be able to know instruction. And beyond the side of instruction lies the ancient symbol of Capricornus the sea goat, dedicated to the two cities of Babylon and Nineveh, one upon the top of a mountain and the other by the shores of the sea part fish, part goat, and the infinite symbol of man's eternal prudence. For in all things man must be prudent. He must be forever mindful of the dangers of excess, and he must realize that even a virtue overworked becomes a vice. He must search for temperance, which makes prudence natural and reasonable. The prudent individual is the one who neither overestimates nor underestimates, thinking that neither that he is stronger than nor weaker than himself. So prudence has about it self-analysis. And the seagull tells us the story of man's prudence God being the higher and lower parts of himself, derived partly from the sign of the mountain and partly from the sign of the valley, the sea goat becomes the symbol of extremes which must be bound by prudence. Man must not ascend too high, nor must he fall too low. For when someone asked Aesop what was the work of the gods, he said the labor of the gods is that they are forever raising up the humble and are forever casting down the great. And this is the problem of prudence. Man must never rise too high. Man must never fall too low. And whatever direction he seems to extend, he must forever search again to control the consequences of excess coming back to prudence. Prudence which causes him to grow no more rapidly than he can. One of the commonest problems of imprudence in growth is the person who overestimating his own attainments rushes forward and takes upon himself responsibilities and duties too much for his knowledge 
and then finds reverse or tragedy. Never overestimate yourself. Never underestimate your adversary. Never overestimate what you know or underestimate what you do not know. But remaining fair and honorable and prudent in all things, use what you know and improve yourself in what you do not know. And you will find a great security, a great um, integrity, which will enable you to live with yourself without doubt. For if you are reasonable and prudent, you have faith in the judgment of yourself. You know that you are careful, that you are thoughtful, that you are rational in your procedures. Now the eleventh sign is a water bearer carrying upon his shoulders the canoptic jar from which pours a strange stream of electrical energy. And the symbol that this carries to the truth seeker in his death in his effort to grow is the eternal uh, recognition that it is the desire of the truth seeker to build better worlds and better ways for others. Therefore, this sign is curiously connected with aspiration. An aspiration is a strange quicksand. Again, man must fight the ores of illusion, for wherever there is a virtue, there is an illusion twisted around it. And as Zalathus Levy, the great French transcendentalist said, in the beautiful pastures of the astral light, every blossom has a poison serpent twisted around the stem. And when you pick the flower, you are bitten by the serpent. No aspiration is like that. We all desire to build a better world. We desire to create this golden age we look for. We seek utopias, but we know why they have failed. We seek to bestow upon others vision which they cannot receive. We demand from others understanding which they cannot give. We find a world unsatisfactory, so we declare war against it and do nothing. We reject society because we do not endorse it. And if it fails to live up to our standard of what it should be, we curse it in our hearts. Forever, behind the thin veneer of altruism, we fall into criticism, condemnation, and strangely subtle destructiveness. And nearly all of our so-called aspiring souls have been antisocial because they have never really understood the world they were trying to help. They have never recognized that we are all working with children. We are working with good children and not bad adults. We are working with those who cannot know more than they do. And we must build our dreams of a better world upon realities, upon things as they are, recognizing that progress is a series of slow and gentle steps, and that if we take one step wisely, we lift the world further than when we race ahead and then beckon it to follow. It cannot follow. So aspiration must be geared to abilities, our own and the abilities of others. If we aspire too greatly, we cannot live up to it ourselves, and our conscience hurts us. When we claim virtues that we cannot apply, we injure ourselves. So our claims should be more modest. And we should always aspire to the next thing, moving one step and realizing that the great journey of life is a trip which is made up entirely of single steps. When we so understand, we are then able to bear all things with that virtue which comes under the mystery of the fishes. For in ancient times the fish was sometimes called the symbol of the point. 
And the point, of course, is always the one who buries an empire. He is the one who writes the funeral odes to the glories of all other things. But the point also becomes the symbol in this case of patience, a virtue man has much trouble with, and also of humility, which is easy if we are patient. But patience, humility, and the poesy of high verse belong to this side for its purpose, its real reason for existence is that it teaches man the mystery of enduring. For in the sign of the fishes comes the deluge that wipes away all things. But beyond the deluge there comes a new heaven and a new earth. So the sign of the fishes is always waiting for the resurrection. It is that which having planted the seed of the earth must wait patiently for God who doeth the works. So in this sign man learns that there are things which he can do and there are things which he cannot do. And that it is right and proper for man to labor but the works must be crowned with the life of the universe. Man without the universe can do nothing. Man cannot hasten the gods, nor can he retard them. He can prepare their ways, but he must await their works. So patience means that man can no longer be disillusioned, no longer defeated. No longer can he die of a broken heart because things are not imminently successful. Patience gives perspective, it gives great time. It is the hope of the long visioned. It is the only answer to the great things that must be done. For these things must be fulfilled in the fullness of their own time and not according to the hopes and ambitions of mortals. So patience and humility complete the signs where the road began with courage and all courage ends in patience and all strength must end in humility and then the great cycle begins again for humility <laughs> reveals the courage and gives birth again to the beginning of things for from patience comes a strange kind of courage that is not of this world so the ancient said, man walking the golden road had to learn these mysteries, and we have to learn them today just the same. And out of learning them, we keep the great pattern of the road that leads upward around the stars and into space. And this road is going to continue to lead. And men may conquer space, they may go out and travel to other planets and other stars, but they can never get beyond the mysterious invisible road for which the stars stand for all conquest must fail all discovery must come to naught unless conquest is the conquest of self and discovery is the discovery of that which is locked within the innermost and the furthermost of existence thus the astronomy and the philosophy and the religion of these peoples formed one pattern and I think there is sufficient utility in that pattern to make it worth our remembering and also there is something quaintly delightful in these mythological burdens and the intricate chess games of emotions and attitudes uh, to which they bear witness our ancient friends were very astute in their understanding of human psychology we can profit by the fable if we can apply it to ourselves. And by so doing, we will understand man's journey around the great mystery of the golden road that leads back home. And I think that that more or less summarizes the concept of the ancient astrotheological philosophy. And we thank you very much. <laughs>